I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. In 1606, a brave group of 105 men and boys sailed all the way from England to the New World. Here they established a new colony called Jamestown, and the history of colonial America begins. Jamestown, Yorktown, and Williamsburg. Together, they are known as America's Historic Triangle, where the first English colonists settled in the New World and later paved the way for a new nation. But why? This was during the Age of Discovery, a time when European powers battled each other for new territories. By the time the Virginia colony was being settled by the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch, and the French had all been exploring and colonizing here for centuries in what they called the New World. But of course, Native Americans who had been here for tens of thousands of years simply called the area home. This one specific area of the New World, just a small settlement of about 100 people, would later grow to be hugely important to the history of America. Here's what I'm curious about in America's historic triangle. What was so valuable about the New World that enticed English settlers to come here? Why was this location chosen to be the first settlement? And why wasn't this location chosen? And why were these spots named Jamestown, Yorktown, Williamsburg, and Virginia? What are these archaeologists discovering inside this church? Why are these ships important and this building? What was life like for the 17th century settlers and the 18th century colonists? Why was this university built here and what does it have to do with the capital of Virginia? What do the Rockefellers have to do with this museum and this hotel? How can you taste American history inside this restaurant and sip history in this restaurant? So much to be curious about here in the greater Williamsburg area. We begin our exploration into America's historic triangle at Jamestown, the first permanent English settlement in North America. You will still see the British flag flying over Jamestown today. But why was this location chosen and why did the English come here? Well, King James I of England established the Virginia Company in 1606, hoping to find gold and a water route to the Pacific here in North America. So in 1607, they sailed up this river and decided this would be a pretty nice spot. And it was because of that river that this location was chosen for a new colony named for a queen and a new town named for a king. That colony, of course, Virginia and the town, Jamestown. So that's where we get the name Virginia for Queen Elizabeth I, the Virgin Queen, and where we get the name Jamestown for King James. Even this river was renamed the James River, but when the settlers first came here, it was called the Powhatan River, which brings us to the Native American-English relations of the colonial period. While Jamestown was established on an uninhabited peninsula, it was still within the territory of the Powhatan Indians. At the time, there were more than 100 Powhatan villages near Jamestown. As the English settlers kept creeping more and more into Indian territory, eventually the Anglo-Powhatan Wars broke out and ultimately ended the Indian power over the area. Today, all that history and more is being rediscovered as part of the Jamestown Rediscovery Project, where you can watch archaeologists at work at a live dig as they rediscover American history. It's all under the leadership of Dr. William Kelso, known around here as the Indiana Jones of Jamestown. The building that you see here now is from 1907, commemorating earlier churches that go back as early as 1617. 
uh, and it was in that earliest church on the same spot that the first representative assembly met in, the, in America. And it's, it's the basis, uh, the, the genesis of our, our governmental system. Dr. Kelso's team has unearthed thousands of artifacts here at the church and the surrounding James Fort and Jamestown. They are still learning about America's first colony. To bring all that history back to life, we now head over to another part of Jamestown, the Living History Museum at Jamestown Settlement. Here, costumed interpreters immerse you in the life of the earliest English settlers, including the baker, who likely had a couple of roosters to keep him company during those long days of baking for the entire town. So all of the, I think what's interesting is that all of this had to be shipped over yes. in the early days. Yes. You weren't growing wheat here yet or mm -hmm. anything like wheat that. Wheat doesn't grow very well in Virginia, not as well oh, okay. as corn. Okay. Which is pretty And stubborn. tell me again about, so this flower versus this flower. Who had this okay, and then who had this? this would have been your coarse uh, wheat flour or say rye flour, oat flour, would have been more suited for the working class, whereas this fine milled white flour was more suited for the tables of gentry. And you know what, they, they got their uh, just desserts later because we all come to find out that this is the healthier stuff anyhow, yes, right? Yes. <laughs> so those snooty upper class, fine, you can have right. that, that processed white, <laughs> or the, the bleached white flour all you want. Oh, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. 17th century bread. It smells good mm -hmm. as new. That's yes. great. Then, from baking to sailing, you can learn what it was like for those original settlers who crossed the Atlantic in 1606 to establish Jamestown. Ready on the main. Ready on the main. Ready on the main. You can board life-sized replicas of the three ships, the Godspeed, the Susan Constant, and the Discovery. You can even join the crew and hoist a sail. Oh, oh, oh. I'm hauling! I'm hauling! That's well, in a vast. Next in our historic triangle is adorable Yorktown, one of the oldest towns in America. It was named after the equally adorable York, England, which is a lovely spot to have tea and scones if you have the time, but I digress. Today, Yorktown, Virginia includes many of its original buildings. Some are rebuilt and all are just lovely. Yorktown developed around 1691 because of its proximity to the York River, which is just a few blocks behind me here. It became a very important port for the Virginia colony shipping goods in and out. In fact, they did such a good job with all that shipping that it is believed that the American tariff system began right here in tiny Yorktown. That's right, this is the Colonial Custom House. This is where all the goods coming into the colony from the port were taxed. But of course, Yorktown is historic for another important event, the American Revolution. You can experience Yorktown's role in the war at two locations, Yorktown Battlefield and the American Revolution Museum at Yorktown where there is another living history museum with enthusiastic costumed interpreters. The Outdoor Living History Museum will help you to experience what life was like for the soldiers here. And at the nearby farmstead, you can also experience the life of the everyday folk. Simple things we take for granted today, like clothing, all had to be made by hand. You wouldn't believe all the steps involved to create linen fabric. You start with just a small handful of dry, brittle flax. How in the world does this become soft fabric? Well, you bash it with this special wooden bashing thing, of course. Any method to the madness, just drop it. Not really, just drop it and hang on. <laughs> but we're just beginning. Then you swat it on a second wooden swatting thing. And then finally, you pull it through a brush that looks more like a tiny bed of nails. Just like hair in a hairbrush. All that to make a tiny batch of thread that then has to go through a whole other process to become actual fabric. That then has to be cut and sewn into clothing. Wow. No wonder the colonists only owned one outfit. Now that we're all dressed, we go to the third point in our historic triangle, to the largest of the three towns and cities, Williamsburg, once the capital of the Virginia colony. But why was this location chosen? Well, it has something to do with this very important building right here. 
1693, King William III and Queen Mary II signed a charter for a perpetual college of divinity, philosophy, languages, and my favorite part, other good arts and sciences, all to be built in the Virginia colony. And you'll never guess what they called it, the College of William and Mary. That's right, the College of William and Mary is the reason why Williamsburg developed here. It all started here at the Wren Building, named in honor of Sir Christopher Wren, who designed St. Paul's Cathedral in London. The Wren Building was built between 1695 and 1700, making it the oldest college building still standing in the United States. Today, it functions as the entrance to the campus, but once the Wren Building was the entire college. So, why and how was William and Mary established here, just a few short years after the colony of Jamestown was established? Didn't the colonists have other things to worry about, like, you know, survival? Why did they decide to have a college here? Well, some of it was to spread knowledge and, and spread uh, the doctrine of the Church of England across the colonies. It makes them look good. Uh, they're, they're founding an institution of, of higher learning. They're also setting up a place to train ministers to work in the new world. The Wren building wasn't just the college. It was also the temporary capital of the colony of Virginia. And then the town of Williamsburg grew around the college. College students give a group of addresses May 1st, 1699 to convince the legislature to move the, the capital here and establish a new city. So the city of Williamsburg is younger than the College of William and Mary. And in fact, the city is laid out from the college. So this is the, you know, the, the beginning point of that survey. And if you stand here at the beginning point and look east, you can see where Williamsburg grew and grew all along Duke of Gloucester Street, all the way to the Williamsburg Capitol building, from one capital to another. Which brings us to our next curious location, Colonial Williamsburg. Once the capital moved here, the town was renamed Williamsburg after King William III. That was in the 1600s, but what you see here today is because of what happened in the 1900s. Williamsburg was settled in 1633, but Colonial Williamsburg came about around 1926. Why? Well, because of a reverend and a Rockefeller. Yep, in the 1920s, Reverend Goodwin of Williamsburg convinced John D. Rockefeller Jr. to help preserve the heritage of Colonial Williamsburg. So plans were made to create this one-of-a-kind, unique, open-air, outdoor living history museum. About 500 buildings have been restored or recreated, all centered along Duke of Gloucester Street, which was the original main street of Williamsburg. So many beautiful historic buildings uh, to see here in Colonial Williamsburg. This one is the grandest. Tell me yes. about this particular building behind us. Uh, this is the governor's palace. This was the home to nine different governors over the course of the 1700s. In that time period, a governor wasn't at all what we think of as a governor today. W weren't they appointed by the king? Exactly. Yeah, the governor's, a whole different ball game. <laughs> the governors appointed by His Majesty the King are serving at His Majesty's behest, but we are the most loyal, the oldest, the wealthiest, and the proudest colony of his Majesty. So we have no problems with that until the 1760s or so. <laughs> no, then, then it becomes a minor problem. And I also think it's interesting that it's called a governor's palace. Yes. Not mansion, not home. <laughs> Palace. Originally, it was meant to be a right house for the governor uh, because every governor had lived in just a private residence somewhere in the capital city, whether here or at Jamestown previously. So they decide to build a, an executive mansion. Governor Spotswood starts allocating so many funds from the General Assembly that they basically said, whoa, 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 Spotswood, you and your palace need to calm down. And someone went, oh. I like that name, and it just kind of stuck ever okay. since. Okay, excellent. So it wasn't like, oh, you're going to be like a king in oh, your palace. No. Okay, you're like, no, 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 <laughs> no. no, 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 no. George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison are all a part of Williamsburg's history. But it is also lovely to experience the life of the everyday folk here, inside the taverns and shops that have been painstakingly recreated and are full of authentic detail. What we're doing right now. You will learn all kinds of unexpected trivia here, like those whalebone corsets were an all too real fact of life for ladies back then. Okay, so this. Just, just, just in case. New style wow. stays 
engineered to give you a slightly more natural figure, lightly boned. Now, when you say boned, would it, in this time period, would it have actually been bone? Um, which we call whalebone, or wood. <laughs> but men don't understand what we're <laughs> Nice thing and over at the apothecary, you will learn that deer antlers made great Christmas cookies. Well, of course they do. This one, I think, is, is fun. Deer antler? Okay. So there's the product called ammonia carbonate, which is used, um, has been used for cooking as a leavening agent. So 18th century, we would make it by grating deer antler, heating it, and oh. then the... Um, finished product was called salt of hartshorn, or today we'd say ammonia carbonate. So German Christmas cookies were made out of deer antler? Originally, the, um, the ammonia carbonate to make those was made out of deer antler, and, and I'm pretty sure we, you don't have to use it um, today. But we also use it for smelling salts. If you feel like fainting, we can stick some Who in the world thought of that? Said, hey, I see a deer antler. Let me make some cookies let's, let's out of it. Let's eat it and see what happens. Some of this goes back to ancient medicine, Greek and Roman, and right. these stories have been lost, but it, it amazes us. It's like, who's the first one that decides to distill something and say, hey, I can use it for this? I can use that. So much to see and learn in Colonial Williamsburg. When Rockefeller was building Colonial Williamsburg, he did something else rather smart, too. He and his wife, Abby Aldrich Rockefeller, had a luxury hotel built just steps away. The beautiful Williamsburg Inn is on the National Register of Historic Places. It was built in 1937, and it has some curious names attached to it, like Rockefeller, Churchill, and Her Majesty. Her Majesty the Queen stayed here at the Williamsburg Inn twice, in 1957 and again in 2007, to commemorate the 350th and then the 400th anniversaries of Jamestown. And she actually even descended this very staircase, probably a lot more elegantly than I am. And it was during her 1957 visit that this photo was taken. There's even a suite named after her, right next to the suite named after Winston Churchill. So I guess that little 1776 bump in English-American relations has been smoothed over by now. The royal touches are just the beginning of the luxury and history here. Since the Rockefellers had the inn built, it is only fitting that there is a restaurant here called the Rockefeller Room. And here you can order Oysters Abbey, named after Abbey Rockefeller. So, uh, here we have the Oysters Abbey. And, you can and there's another way you can taste your history here. The executive chef uses the same spices that the early American colonists used in his dishes today. We do fresh breads for the restaurant every day. Uh, we also serve it with a, uh, a high-fat European butter with our Tradewind Spice Blend. You had me at high-fat, but uh, so, so we love that. And then talk about fat the... Fat equals flavor. Fat equals flavor. Why don't people understand that? Um, uh, what, what are the spices that you use? So That's the spices on this is our Tradewind Spice Blend. It's garam masala, black pepper, and vanilla bean. Sorry, what was that first one again? Garam masala. What is that? Garam masala is a uh, combination of spices. It's actually a spice blend. Uh, it consists of uh, cumin, pepper, coriander, uh, cardamom, cinnamon, clove. Oh, wow. So it's a nice blend there. And then we accompany that with black pepper and vanilla bean. You know where we got that idea? Where? We found out that Thomas Jefferson experimented with that flavor profile in ice cream. Yummy. Another fun way to experience history here is every day at sunset, when a special fife and drum corps marches through the lobby and out onto the terrace, complete with an adorable little dog, of course, named Liberty. Next, from colonial spices to colonial vintages, we now visit the historic Williamsburg Winery, which wasn't always called Williamsburg Winery. Here's a bit of curious history you may not know. This vineyard almost was the location for Jamestown settlement because aboard the Godspeed was a man named Captain Gabriel Archer, and he thought this location was perfect. But his rival, Captain John Smith, overruled him. Sadly, just a few years later, Captain Archer passed away at Jamestown. So in his honor, this location was renamed Archer's Hope. So that's why today you can dine in the Gabriel Archer Tavern at Williamsburg Winery. 
This historic vineyard was founded by Patrick Duffler, who brought years of European winemaking experience to Williamsburg. And he loves to share how winemaking began here in America in the early 1600s. They said every settler should acquire the training of vines because in those days, if you left a glass of water on the side of the counter for uh, two or three hours or two or three days, it didn't stay well. But wine and beer are stable. Interesting. And here's what's really cool. The winery has vintages named after famous American colonists. And finally, from wine to brew, there is one more tasty bit of history in the historic district of Williamsburg, with an interesting historic tie to a certain founding father and some founding furry fellas. Hello. Amber Ox, is an, as, the, as the name itself, is directly tied back to the oxen and their role in the Colonial Williamsburg era and farming and, you know, the agriculture market back in, uh, back in the, the establishment of Colonial Williamsburg or Williamsburg as a city, and, um, you know, we wanted to kind of pay homage to that. The Amber Ox, or oxen with reddish coats, used to pull grain carts through the streets of Williamsburg. They were also the same type of red-coated oxen used at George Washington's Mount Vernon, where, of course, George had his own distillery. Cheers. How's that for an interesting bit of thirsty history? Now, as far as um, brew recipes, mm -hmm. those have probably changed a bit over the years. Yeah. Um, I don't somehow recall in um, studying up on my history that in colonial times they had anything called the thing with the stuff. Yeah, no, they probably definitely didn't have the thing with the stuff. They, uh, <laughs> it's funny when somebody orders and they're like, I'll take the thing with the stuff. Yeah, of course perfect. you will. Yeah, of course yeah, you will. Right. Amber Ox Public House is known for their quirky named small batch brews like Made You Look, Little Tyrant, and the thing with the stuff. But if you come for the brew, you will stay for the food. It is out of this world good. Executive chef Troy Buckley, all tatted up and grinning from ear to ear, created the divine recipes here. I want to see what you reach for. You know what I'm going to reach for. Right, what are you going to reach for? Vegetarian. Gonna, is that what you're going to yeah, do? Yeah, yeah right, I'm going straight fine, for I'm gonna go you ready? the biscuit. There you go. <laughs> there you drop biscuit. All right, let's see. Let's do the taste test here. I all right. get some of that bacon jam. Though. There you go. That's where it's at. To your health. Yeah, cheers. Oh my God, what did I just eat? It's so good. Mm. But on the bottom is my grit cake. And yes, then that's the spoon bread. Yes, ma'am. It's carb and carb. That's why it's so good. Yeah. Holy cow. Yeah, what more do you want? Like Nothing. One, right? I'm not sure if the early English colonists ate spoon bread on top of grit cakes, but they sure are good. So, from a quest for gold aboard three small ships that braved one large ocean, all to create a tiny settlement named after the English king, then on to another original English town that played an important role when English-American relations weren't so good. But it was still important to look good, even if it took forever to get dressed to an institution of higher learning named after a king and queen that became the capital of this thriving colony named after a different queen. Then that capital moved here and yet another new town developed where colonists could shop and squeeze into the latest fashions. And nearby is a winery that was almost the original settlement and also nearby is the perfect old meets new tavern of sorts that pays tribute to the four-legged furry workers of the colonial era. Which brings us back to another four-legged furry friend named Liberty. And this is where we wrap up our tour of Greater Williamsburg and sleep steeped in history and luxury in a spot good enough for the queen of the country who started a colony here all those centuries ago. America's historic triangle has so much to be curious about. Thank you for joining us on our educational journey and hopefully now you're even more curious about the who, what, where, why, when, and how of colonial America. As the colonists would say, farewell and Godspeed.